James Hessler will prevent, se present sickles at Gettysburg. James Hessler is a licensed battlefield guide at Gettysburg National Military Park. His book, Sickles at Gettysburg, The Controversial Civil War General Who Committed Murder, Abandoned Little Round Top, and Declared Himself the Hero of Gettysburg. This book received the Batchelder Coddington Literary Award and the Gettysburg Roundtable's Distinguished Book Award. He's a frequent speaker at Civil War Roundtables and Gettysburg Foundation programs. He has been a contributor to Gettysburg Magazine, Gettysburg Daily, and America's Civil War. He's been a guest on National Public Radio, Pennsylvania Cable Network TV, and Civil War Radio, and has taught Gettysburg-related courses for Harrisburg Area Community College. Please welcome Mr. James Hessler. All right, thank you. Can you, uh, can you hear me okay in the back of the tent? Sounds okay? Well, uh, first of all, thanks for having me, and I want to uh, thank the Gettysburg Foundation for inviting me to participate again uh, this year. Uh, I think we're on, a, what, what did we decide? We're on a, about the ninth day of the commemoration, and I think all of us are feeling a little combat fatigue, uh, but still a good, good crowd here in the uh, tent. You know, some of you, and some of you have heard me give this speech many, many times, right, Mickey? But, um, you know, some of you have heard me talk about this before, but, you know, I take a lot of grief in Civil War circles for being the Sickles guy. Uh, some of the grief that I take is, is good-natured. Um, does anybody know, know the name of General Sickles' father? Pop Sickles, okay? So that's kind of cute. That's kind of cute. If I... Uh, if 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 I never if I never heard if I ne if some if I never heard Jim Sickles didn't have a leg to stand on ever again I would I would die happy, and some of it's and some of it's not so good natured. I can think of at least uh, three times in my career that I have been berated by drunken men in bars, uh, having an angry anti Sickles rage. Um, and then there's all then one of my favorite stories is the time that my wife was uh, accosted by a reenactor at a barbecue. She was in line to get her potato salad, and this guy found out she was married to the Sickles guy, and uh, proceeded to just berate her for uh, uh, the entire length of her stay over how Sickles was a murderer and and stuff like that. Uh, so, you know, Sickles is the kind of guy we love to hate him. And let me, let me get a little show of hands here. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with General Sickles, familiar with the story, how many of you would say that you have a, a negative impression of General Sickles? Even my new boss raised his hand. Uh-oh, I'm in trouble. All right. How many of you are brave enough to say you have a favorable impression of General Sickles? All right, all right, all right, thank you. And how many of you would say you're on the fence? Okay. All right. I saw a few hands go up twice, but we'll uh, we'll take that. The, uh, the I was I I reminded myself though this morning that this um, this this tendency to to make joke at si jokes at Sickles' expense is is fortunately not a modern phenomenon. Uh, in the 1870s, there was reportedly a popular children's song that ran along the lines of "General Sickles killed a man, fried him in a frying pan." So making jokes at Sickles' expense is not new. But, you know, this idea today that he is the villain of Gettysburg and over the past, you know, two weeks or so of Sacred Trust lectures, you have attended everything from, you know, uh, uh, ex-military guys talking about military doctrine to uh, guys making references to Greek and classic literature. But I think I think the the best the best way that we can perpetuate history is to tell good stories and every good story needs a villain and a Gettysburg dance sickles gives you that but he's also a hugely important guy and love him or hate him he has what i think is one of the most profound impacts on this battlefield not only is he hugely influential during the battle itself but he gives us some of gettysburg's most colorful post-battle history and last but not least as sue alluded to uh, in some of her uh, uh, pictures in her last presentation sickles is a hugely driving force not only in the early development of gettysburg national military park but also a frequent attendee at 
battlefield uh, veterans reunions right up until he died. Uh, the 150th anniversary that we are just sort of concluding our commemoration of was actually the 100th anniversary of Sickles' last visit to Gettysburg. He was a star attraction at the 50th anniversary in 1913. So Sickles is a really important guy, and he's a fun and a colorful guy. And I guarantee that I am going to mention adultery and prostitution in today's speech more than all of the other sacred trust talks combined. Okay? <laughs> Nothing, this is not a G-rated presentation. All right, so uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to have to go through Sickles' colorful and entertaining early years fairly quickly. Uh, we think Sickles was probably born in 1819, which would have made him plus or minus 44 years old at the uh, Battle of Gettysburg, when, of course, he commanded the Union Army's Third Corps. Uh, again, you know, prior to the Civil War, he had risen through the ranks of New York's Tammany Hall politics. Uh, he was an attorney, uh, a rising political star in New York City. Plenty of early stories associated associated with Sickles about embezzlement of funds, stealing money from the post office, and of course some of the better known stories, he was uh, romantically involved with a high-end prostitute in New York City by the name of Fanny White, and he both at the early times in his career, he both enraged his colleagues in the New York Assembly by bringing her onto the Senate floor, and later when he was uh, positioned in England serving under James Buchanan, Sickles also created a minor diplomatic uproar by a allegedly introducing this hooker to Queen Victoria. So there, I've said, Jerry, what, I've said prostitute now at least three times already, and we're only about, we're only about seven minutes into it, okay? But I think, I think one of the, one of the, in all seriousness, though, one of the points that I want to make, I think we are greatly in danger of sanitizing our Gettysburg history. This notion, you know, it started with Robert E. Lee and the so-called marble man, that Lee was perfect, and, you know, you couldn't, you know, had no character flaws. And I think what, one unfortunate thing we're doing today is we're transferring that marble man mentality down to a lot of the generals. God help the man, for example, today who would criticize General Meade, or really almost any of the Union generals on the battlefield. And I think what is important is we want to remember that these are real guys. These people are really relatable. And if you can make a guy like Sickles relatable, you know, that, that to me makes the story more interesting. So I would call, sort of call Sickles the anti-marble man. And I think he's got a couple of key features that we can all relate to during the course of his life. He has chronic woman problems. Uh, he has chronic financial problems. And no offense, Paul, but he was also a guy who frequently was in trouble for hating his boss, right? And those are at least those are at least at least two of those three things we can all we can all often relate to. So, anyways, what you're looking at here on the slide is you're looking at uh, one of the rare pre-war uh, images of Citizen Dan Sickles, um, and again, probably taken sometime in the 1850s when he was a politician uh, in New York politics. Now, the woman next to him, the smiling young woman next to him is a family friend by the name of Teresa Bagioli. Now, Teresa was um, about 16 years younger than Sickles, so one of his common character traits is that he seems to like really younger women. Uh, but Sickles had married this family friend, Teresa, uh, in about 1852 when he was 33 years old and she was 16 years old. Now, at the time, again, he was busy in Tammany Hall politics. She, at the time, was a uh, Catholic schoolgirl who was in a uh, uh, boarding school. Why why would a 33-year-old uh, rising politician marry a 16-year-old Catholic schoolgirl? Anyone? She was pregnant. He had knocked her up. He knocked her up. So, you know, say, say what you want about Sickles, but at least he did the right thing by marrying her and making an honest woman out of her, right? Okay, so those are sort of the early years. So now what happens is Sickles was a, uh, Sickles was a protege of future President James Buchanan, and Sickles served uh, on Buchanan's staff in 1853-54 while uh, Buchanan was on diplomatic assignment in England. But things start to really get interesting in 1856 when Sickles is elected to Congress, again from the good state of New York, at about the same time that his mentor, Buchanan, is moved into the White House. 
Okay, so many of you know the, what, what we think are the basics of the story. While in Washington, Sickles, a well-known womanizer, and, and to his credit, an ambitious hard worker, Sickles is frequently away. He probably isn't giving his young wife, Teresa, as much attention as she deserves. So during the course of his tenure in Washington, Sickles becomes romantic, I'm sorry, Teresa Sickles becomes romantically involved with a district attorney in Washington by the name of Philip Barton Key. Now, many of you may know Philip Barton Key was the son of Francis Scott Key, author of our uh, Star Spangled Banner. But anyways, Teresa Sickles and Key, and Key and Sickles were also friends, I should point that out, but Teresa and Key start having this romantic uh, liaison while they, are, while they are in Washington. Now one day in February 1859, after receiving a few warnings, Congressman Sickles finally confirms, in fact, that his wife uh, is sleeping with his friend Key, and one day in February of 59, on the streets of Washington, right behind the White House. Sickles comes out of his house, and there's a quick confrontation with Key on the streets of Washington, and Congressman Sickles shoots Key dead, repeatedly, several times. Now, Key, unfortunately, as many people know the story, was, in fact, unarmed. The only thing that he had to defend himself with was an opera glass. So you would think the idea of a rich, powerful congressman shooting an equally rich, powerful district attorney on the streets of Washington would have made for pretty scandalous headlines, and it did. Sickles basically turns himself in. And in what has often been termed the trial of the 19th century... Sickles assembles this legal dream team. Okay, now the, I know the great Ed Bars spoke up here, I think, on Friday. Uh, I know referring to Sickles as the O.J. Simpson of Gettysburg is one of Ed's gim favorite gimmicks. I often do that myself, but I'm doing Ed one better. I actually have historic then and now photography here to, uh, to, to, to demonstrate what this would have looked like. So what you're looking at on the one side of the screen is a, uh, a contemporary wood carving that was published in the newspapers of the time of Sickles rotting in jail, pleading his case, overcome with emotion, wondering what was going to happen to his career. And, well, you know who the other guy is, so we don't have to go into that. But the comparison is, is that Sickles assembles this legal dream team, and it's a highly sensationalized, highly publicized murder trial. It's got everything, sex, adultery, politics. Again, Sickles was a great friend of President Buchanan, and, of course, celebrity murder, which is always a crowd pleaser. And it sold great, great volumes of newspapers all over the country. In some markets like San Francisco, the murder trial was actually censured for obscenity. Uh, for obscenity. Did I say obscenity? Obscenity. But what Sickles' dream legal team does, and the team is best remembered today for the presence of future Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, but for you hardcore Civil War guys, Stanton is not the lead on the team, and Stanton doesn't ultimately come up with what is the novel defense of temporary insanity. And what they, what Sickles' lawyers basically present before the judge and the jury was that the idea of Sickles catching, more or less catching his wife in the act of having an affair with another man was so emotionally alarming that at least Sickles' mind temporarily became diseased. That was the phrase they used, his mind became diseased. The judge allowed them to present that to the jury, and while public opinion was resoundingly in Sickles' favor throughout the trial anyways. It was this novel defense that seemingly got Sickles off. Now, it's what the trial is remembered for, the first successful use of temporary insanity ever used in United States history. But really, when they canvassed the jurors afterwards, the male, the male, the white male jury afterwards, what the men on the jury essentially said was it wasn't so much the temporary insanity defense, but it was essentially that, um, you know, the jury, the jury was sympathetic to the fact that Sickles had to protect his property, his wife, his household from this adulterer key. And it really was that idea of, you know, adultery was the real sin and that Teresa Sickles and Key were the bad guys that really got Sickles off. So the next time you're on a Ranger Walk Hell, the next time you're on one of my tours and I tell you it was all about temporary insanity, that's not exactly true. It was really more public opinion in the moral code of the time. But the bottom line, again, much like the OJ trial, what happens eventually, though, is Sickles and Teresa reconcile shortly after the trial, and it's that reconciliation that sends Sickles' public approval ratings plummeting. So, 
Yeah, you like that, huh? That's that that was the real crime, not shooting the guy, but the real crime was reconciling with your your dirty scarlet wife. That was the real crime at the time so that as as we moved into the months and years after the trial, Sickles's public approval what would have been the equivalent of public approval ratings were at an all-time low because of that. So the bottom line is when the civil the American Civil War begins in the spring of 1861, Sickles had not run for Congress again. He had not run for re-election, and he needed a new career. And that's going to bring us up into the Civil War. Now, what you are looking at on this page is you're looking at what is actually a fairly, you know, these images of sickles in military uniforms standing on two legs, not one, but two legs. These sorts of images are actually fairly rare. So this is a circa 1861 uh, image of what at that time would have been a young Brigadier General Dan Sickles. But at the beginning of the Civil War, Sickles needs a new career, and he sees an opportunity to raise troops in New York City, what is going to become known as the Excelsior Brigade that fights with him uh, out here at Gettysburg. Sickles raises troops. Now, he doesn't pay for the troops. He kind of dives out the back window and stiffs one of his friends with the recruiting bill. But Sickles is the guy who kind of parades the troops in front of Washington as being my guys. Uh, a, a new president, who some of you may have heard of by the name of Abraham Lincoln, President Lincoln needs support for this new unpopular war effort of his. So even though Sickles is at that point a disgraced Democrat, Lincoln needs really any Democrat that he can get, a prominent one such as Sickles. And what Lincoln also needs is fighting aggressive guys. And I think Lincoln kind of likes Sickles' moxie, his, you know, his enthusiasm, his aggressiveness. And what's going to happen now is Sickles is, I'm sorry, Lincoln is going to promote Sickles' rise throughout the Union Army of the Potomac during the early stages of the war. Now, Sickles had never gone to West Point, so, you know, guys who are going to come up here, I think, later today and talk about 19th century military doctrine, throw that stuff out the window with Sickles. He never studied, you know, military matters that we know of, and he probably never gave the military any serious thought of a career. But now in the early stages of the war, Lincoln is going to promote Sickles, become a one-star general, and finally a two-star major general at Gettysburg. At Gettysburg, as some of you know, Sickles is going to basically be the highest ranking non-West Pointer in the Union Army. So again, getting back to the slide here, we have Sickles on the page with uh, two of his early supporters. Now, you all probably know who the uh, guy, and well, I'm, as I'm looking at it, it's the top left corner of the page. Uh, that is Union General Joe Hooker, fighting Joe Hooker. And down at the bottom of the page, uh, the gentleman with sort of the receding hairline and the mustache, that is another New York general by the name of Dan Butterfield. Sickles, Hooker, and Butterfield in the months leading up to the Getty campaign are going to become great friends and are really going to sort of set the stage for, if nothing else, for the social calendar of the Army of the Potomac leading into Gettysburg. Okay, now probably many of us know, you know, Hooker, right or wrong, deserved or not, Hooker has a reputation as a hard drinker and a womanizer. Although it's not true that the term Hooker comes today from General Joe Hooker, uh, well, that's not true. It is true that General Hooker probably did enjoy using their service at various times during his life. And so, you know, I often term Sickles in, in, in the modern terminology, in the modern terminology, I think Sickles is probably a pretty good ass kisser, if I can use that word. I just did. I can use that word. And what I mean by that, you know, we talked about how Sickles basically was kissing Lincoln's butt really throughout the war. But as Hooker's star was rising during the early stages of the Civil War, Sickles also sort of latched himself onto Hooker's star. So almost every time Hooker gets promoted up through the ranks, Sickles kind of comes in behind him so that by early 1863, Sickles, with some really limited combat experience, is commanding the Union Army's Third Corps. So you have Hooker, the the drunk. You have Sickles, we've already covered, the acquitted murderer. I should, again, point out he was acquitted. But Sickles, the murderer, both of them being womanizers. And then I think Dan Butterfield has probably the most bizarre legal background of the three. The, uh, the chief of staff of the Union Army uh, in his youth was actually an arsonist. 
And what had happened was uh, in, in, in central New York as he was growing up, Jen, Dan Butterfield, uh, his father, John Butterfield, was a prominent businessman who later went on to found uh, part of what is known today as the American Express Company. But anyways, in his youth, Dan Butterfield apparently liked to set houses on fire and watch them burn. And his dad was often having to bail him out of trouble for that. So it's really these three guys who, prior to the Battle of Gettysburg, are amongst the highest ranking officers in the Union Army. So as we talk about military doctrine in the great Robert E. Lee, is it any wonder that the Union Army is having a hard time winning battles with guys like these at the top ranks? But what, for, what, what, for what these guys lack, though, in terms of battlefield experience and battlefield success, they do know how to have a good time. And there, there are several stories in the winter of 1862 into the spring of 1863 about party time in the Union headquarters. They are having parties in winter quarters. Guys are coming in and saying, you know, you know we're in the middle of nowhere in Virginia. Where are, they, where are these Hooker, where's Hooker and Sickles and Butterfield? Where are these guys getting all these women from? You know, these guys are coming into camp. They're having a good time. One, uh, one Union officer famously exclaims that during that winter, headquarters of the Army of the Potomac was a place that no self-respecting man would want to go and no self-respecting women woman would want to be seen at. It was a combination of bar room and brothel. Unfortunately, when George Meade takes command, the party is over. All right. Now, George, as, as many of you know, General Hooker is, um, who again, I like Hooker, I think he's a good general, but he's overmatched at the Battle of Chancellorsville. Hooker is more or less soundly thrashed uh, in his only shot at command of the Union Army at Chancellorsville, fought in May of 1863. As you know, on June 28th of 1863, General George Meade, former commander of the Union Army 5th Corps, is placed in command of the Union Army. Um, now, for all of Meade's many admirable and great attributes, comparing Meade to guys like Sickles and Hooker, Meade is probably not the guy you're going to want to call on when you want to have a good time. Uh, he is happily married. He's a very conservative man. I've never seen any accounts to indicate that Meade is a heavy drinker, unlike the others. Um, so, you know, he's not, he's not a fun guy. He's a serious guy. You know, Meade at Gettysburg is only 47 years old, you see pictures like this where he looks like he's about 147 years old. You know, Meade is the kind of guy who wears the weight of the world on his shoulders, I think, and when Meade is placed in command of the Union Army on June 28th, he is feeling tremendous pressure. Okay, now one of the things that we are guilty of uh, as historians sort of making shorthanded history, this debate between Meade and Sickles is really often shorthanded as the difference between Meade the West Pointer and Sickles the dreaded political general. And while those differences undoubtedly play into and contribute to their spectacular failure to communicate here at Gettysburg, that political versus West Point difference was not the only problem that these two guys have, because quite frankly there are quite a number of political generals in the Civil War who ultimately turn out to be very competent, if not good, officers. So Sickles had the makings to be, to be a good officer. But what happens between these two is I think it's a combination of personality differences during that party time leading up to Gettysburg. Meade was frequently excluded from Sickles and Hooker and Butterfield's parties. Meade was also unpopular within Sickles' Third Corps. And one of the things I outlined in my book is I really think that started at the Battle of Fredericksburg when Meade got into a dispute over support with another Third Corps general by the name of David Burney. And then finally after Chancellorsville there had been a, di a dispute that reached the newspapers. Uh, there was a dispute over whether or not Hooker had wanted the army to retreat after Chancellorsville. Uh, it, got, it went public. Meade sort of canvassed the generals because Meade was one of the guys who so supposedly favored a retreat. In this dispute between Hooker and Meade, Sickles supported his old buddy Hooker. I think that's a rare case of Sickles, the butt kisser, basically not seeing that Meade's star was on the rise. So when Meade takes command on June 28th, Meade is basically right on Sickles' back right off the start as they're marching up from Maryland into Pennsylvania. Meade is sending Sickles a bunch of dispatches saying, get moving, you're not marching to my satisfaction, you're holding up some of the trains. And I think, I think far be it, you know, you know, there's sort of a common misconception that Sickles the hot dog comes here into Gettysburg and really, for lack of a better word, sort of tells Meade to go to hell. And I think what's actually happening is quite the opposite. I think in a lot of ways Sickles is actually suffering from a lack of confidence, a crisis of confidence, 
if you can believe that, here at Gettysburg because this is the first time he's on the outset headquarters. And I think when you sort of get into this positioning on the morning of July 2nd, Sickles really isn't sure what he is supposed to do. And that's going to lead to our next slide. Okay, now... Over the past nine days, I can't tell you how many times I have received emails and text messages from friends saying, get down to the battlefield. They're trashing sickles on the battle walks. Get over to the tent. The guy on stage is trashing sickles in the sacred trust. Look, everybody's got an opinion. Um, you know, obviously what happens on the morning of July 2nd is, if nothing else, a spectacular failure to communicate. You know, as you can see on the map there, what essentially happens is Sickles and his 11,000-man Third Corps. They are supposed to occupy the left flank of the Union Army, which in theory would have stretched them out to Little Round Top. And I'm going to go into Sickles and Meade's orders and communications in a few moments. But, you know, to kind of set the table here, what happens instead during the afternoon is Sickles, instead of occupying what would be an extension of the straight line fish hook on Cemetery Ridge, and keep in mind what is clear to us as a fish hook today was not as necessarily clear to the guys at the time. They had no modern Hancock Avenue to try to guide them in. They didn't have aerial maps like this. Nobody at any point in the battle ever said, rally around the fishhook boys. But what happens is it becomes pretty obvious from Meade's instructions to Sickles that morning. Sickles is supposed to get the left flank, but Sickles decides that the higher ground, roughly half to three quarters of a mile in front of him, is going to be better ground, in his opinion, to place his troops. And anchoring it, which is sort of a, a a messy V, the black V on the front of the map, Sickles is going to center a lot of his movements around a desire to capture the peach orchard along the Emmitsburg Road. Forget temporarily about Little Round Top, the wheat field. I often think the peach orchard is one of the most underrated spots on the battlefield because it is really driving both Sickles' need, desire to occupy that position on the afternoon of July 2nd, and it is going to occupy a desire to get it is going to drive a lot of Lee and Longstreet's strategy on that afternoon of July 2nd. So Sickles moves forward. Um, there's a couple of reasons why he says he moves forward. First of all, he's going to insist to his dying day that he was somewhat confused by General Meade's orders. Now, I know a lot of guys and ladies out there who are saying that's ridiculous. General General Meade's orders were very clear, very clear cut. There was no way Sickles could have got confused about him. So I'm going to address that in a moment. But he says he's confused about Meade's orders. He also claims that he dislikes what many of us know as the low ground today, just north of Little Round Top. And there is some merit in that argument. That area north of Little Round Top is very low ground, not good positions for artillery. You don't have good sight lines if the enemy's going to come up and attack you. So I think he's got some merit in that argument. Sickles is also going to compl com complain that he's going to claim that he basically lacks the manpower to cover the entire line that Meade wanted him to occupy. And that's certainly one area where Sickles' argument and reasoning falls apart, because in moving forward, if you sort of see the shaded extension of the fish hook on my map, and then you go to that long extended V in front of it, unfortunately, by moving forward, the line Sickles goes into is really going to be twice as long as the one Meade wanted him to be in. Into. So that's definitely one part of the Sickles doctrine that, that doesn't really hold up to much scrutiny. But last but not least, now in the 50-year spin campaign that will begin shortly after the Battle of Gettysburg and go for the remainder of his right life, Sickles is going to add another thought, another reason. And his reasoning is going to be, he's going to claim that he later advanced to prevent General Meade from retreating at Gettysburg. As the story goes, Sickles is going to claim that the afternoon of July 2nd, Meade wanted to retreat from Gettysburg, perhaps still fall back on his Pipe Creek line, and that one of the benefits Sickles gave the Union Army by moving forward is that Sickles basically brought on the attack. He brought on the battle, and as Sickles used to like to say, I grabbed Longstreet by the throat, and I held him down until reinforcements could come. And so therefore, if you have the guy who brought on the battle that the Union Army won, in Sickles' twisted reasoning, who deserves credit for winning the Battle of Gettysburg? Meade, the guy who supposedly wanted to retreat, or Sickles, the guy who brought on the fight? It's a no-brainer, right? Sickles, and that's the hero of Gettysburg in the title of my book, which, yes, is meant to be somewhat ironic. Okay. 
Now, let's get to the part about the orders. And this is, this is a part where I tend to side with Sickles a little bit more than the haters do. Um, you know, because again, your standard dogma is that Sickles, the twisted, perverted monster, somehow, somehow just ignored direct written orders from the saintly conservative General Meade. And if only Sickles had listened to Meade, the second day of Gettysburg would have gone so much better. That's basically the traditional uh, argument that you will get from 98 percent of the programs that you see here at Gettysburg National Military Park. But what you see on this page, and I'm going to linger on it for a minute to give you a chance to look at it, the three bullet points on this page are basically how George Meade described his orders. I'm too frequently accused of relying on what General Sickles said, and Sickles is sort of biased recollections of what happened. This is how General Meade described his orders, and primarily before the Congressional Committee on the Conduct of the War that began uh, uh, in the, spur, the Gettysburg portion of which began in the spring of 1864. So General Meade said, and I'm not going to read it all verbatim, but General Meade started by saying, I sent instructions, not direct orders, instructions, Chuck, on the morning to General Sickles, directing him to form his corps in line of battle on the left of Hancock's second corps, and I had indicated to him that his right was to rest on General Hancock's left, and his left was to extend to Round Top Mountain which all seems like it makes good sense and is very straightforward right there. Plainly visible, there's no way you could not see Round Top Mountain. But Meade, Meade in his description of these orders then added, if it was practicable to occupy it. And I think this is where you sort of open up a little interpretation. Those two words, two or three words that are at the heart of every Civil War controversy, if practicable, okay? And of course, the best known example of that is General Ewell's failure to take Cemetery Hill on the night of July 1st. Well, you people don't all hate General Ewell for failing to do that, because people realize today that the if practicable potentially, in Ewell's mind, offered up some room for interpretation. So again, that is Meade's description of it. I have heard rangers here at the park say there was no if practicable in General Meade's orders. That is a direct quote from General Meade. Now, the second bullet point, and this is another point that I want to bring out, whether you think Sickles is good, bad, right, wrong, responsible for everything from uh, deaths on the battlefield to global warming, whatever you think of Sickles, one thing that I always point out is remember, he on three occasions that morning, not one, not two, but three occasions that morning, communicated either directly to headquarters or through General Meade's staff. Sickles said, look, I've got some issues with where I'm supposed to be. I'm confused. I'm not sure where you want this line to be. Can somebody come out and look at it? He did that on three occasions. And Meade addresses this in the second bullet point. Meade said a short time after Afterward, General Sickles came to my headquarters and I told him what my general views were and intimated to him that he was to occupy the position, and I've, I've emphasized here the position, that I understood General Hancock had put General Geary in the night previously. Part of what Sickles is supposed to do is basically replace the 12th Corps up around the round tops, but problem being, in Meade's own words, Meade is implying that he has not actually seen that position. So that could be, again, another where area that's going to open up a little room for confusion. And last but not least, Sickles asked me whether he was authorized to post his corps in such a manner as his judgment he should deem suitable. I told him, certainly within the limits of the general instructions that I have given you, any ground within those limits you choose to occupy, I leave to you. So here's the point. Here's the point, because I know we're already running short on time. The point in my mind is not, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna say that Sickles willfully, flagrantly violated direct and clear orders, you have to have some proof to say that. What I think, what I think the chain of re evidence and the record more clearly suggests is I think Sickles is more guilty of bad judgment than willful violation of orders. I think with what you have here, Sickles kind of said, look, I don't like the position, I'm confused about the position, I've, I've asked headquarters to come out and look at it couple of times. I'm going to now exercise that sort of general discretion to do what I think is a better position. So again, what I think is really happening there is less of, as I often hear people say at the park, it's less of Sickles just flagrantly telling me to go to hell. It's really, though, more of Sickles' lack of training coming out with some spectacularly bad judgment. 
Now, through the Sickles' credit, and one of the things I like about him, for the remainder of his years, he is going to doggedly defend what he did here. And I think the real reason so many folks dislike Sickles today is really not because of what he did on the battlefield, because lots of guys make mistakes on the battlefield, but it's really sort of the dogged determination, the spin that he put on the battle afterwards to try to blame it all on General Meade. And in the fr that first bullet point, I think, sums it, a lot of it up. Sickles would later say, look, whatever we did here, it was not through any misinterpretation of orders. It was either a good line or a bad one. I took it on my own responsibility. I took up, the, I took up that line because it enabled me to hold commanding ground. It was my decision, my call. And if you take that at face value, I think that's really admirable of Sickles to kind of take it all under his wing. Unfortunately, then, though, he adds the fine print, you know, which is kind of along the lines of, yeah, it was my call, but it was really all General Meade's fault. And that's, and that's part of the problem. So in that last bullet point, a good example, you know, he said, fortunately, my left succeeded in getting into position on round top and holding that position. Those positions were firmly held by the third corps. And of course, we more or less know that that was not true. And he did not defend those positions today. Okay, so in wrapping up, as Sickles now, his positions are under heavy attack the evening of July 2nd, a Confederate artillery shell comes, slams into his leg. We have a, uh, a high-resolution picture here on screen of what Sickles' leg bone looked like afterwards. He's carried off the battlefield. His leg is amputated that night, effectively ending his battlefield career. Personally, I don't subscribe to the notion that Meade intended to court-martial Sickles, but did not because he lost lost his leg. I think Meade thought it was a genuine mistake, but again, it makes for good stories. But what happens now is Sickles going back to Washington now to recuperate is going to start now this 50-year assault on General Meade's reputation. And it starts literally in the days after the battle as Sickles is recuperating in his bed and telling General or pre telling President Lincoln that probably something along the lines of I won the battle of Gettysburg, I moved forward, I wasn't getting clear orders from headquarters, and and that's sort of the story now he's going to perpetuate. Sickles, though, and don't feel sorry for him for losing this leg, because what he is going to do is he's now going to use the fact that he only has one leg uh, to really reinvent himself as a war hero. And again, the, some, of the, some of the reunions and pictures Sue alluded to in her presentation, what you frequently see when you talk about these monument dedications and these speeches, what you frequently see is Sickles coming back here and saying, don't don't mind me. I can't stand up today because I lost a leg for you, you know, and stuff like that. You know, you know, I'm, hey, I'm the guy up here with one leg. You literally see him pointing that stuff out. And the veterans love it. They're cheering him. He's a popular public speaker. He's always coming back again and again. And the veterans kind of love that stuff. And I've got a, um, I've got a quote on screen, which I think is very uh, appropriate for how Sickles viewed all this. Uh, the quote is from Mark Twain. Mark Twain got to know Sickles late in life. And Twain has a great quote in his memoirs that basically says, Sickles valued the leg he's lost much more than the one he's got. And if he has to part with one, I'm sure he would still lose the one that he still has. That's Mark Twain on Sickles, who uh, could write it much better than I would. And I think that kind of sums it up, to using that missing leg to great political and professional advantage. Um, now, now, what I do in a lot of my Sickles studies, and a good portion of my book was spent um, regarding his role in the 1880s through the end of his life in the development of the early development of Gettysburg National Military Park. Whether you know it or not, you have been commemorating the 150th anniversary in the house that Dan Sickles built. Okay, Sickles was the congressman in 1895 who introduced the legislation that ultimately created Gettysburg National Military Park. Now, throughout the 80s into the 90s, uh, he was chairman of the New York Monuments Commission, frequent visitor back here, again, giving dedication speeches, uh, uh, appropriating funds for monuments. I was just talking to a friend the other night who was talking about uh, the creation of General Green's monument on Culp's Hill, and this guy was reading about he said, I had no idea Sickles played such a big part in getting the money for that monument. I'm like, yeah, that's what he did. Sickles was into this stuff. Now, you wouldn't want to trust Sickles with the money if you could give the money to somebody else, but he was a good guy to give speeches and to make sure that the work got done. And, of course, during those speeches, again, favorite pet topic, you know, me screwed it all up at Gettysburg sort of thing. But... 
This next slide is, um, a, and I think Sue might have had this one before, I can't remember. But anyways, this is a picture taken at the, uh, in 1888 during a, a reunion on the battlefield. And the two figures in the center of the photo, you can see a, a pudgy middle-aged sickles. And if you look really closely, you can see that missing right leg. And the guy with the big white mutton chops next to him is his opponent, General Longstreet. Well, Sickles and Longstreet became great friends in the post-war years, thoroughly appropriate because because in a lot of corners, both of their war records were under attack, so it was very easy for the two of them to sort of mutually defend each other and defend each other's records. Longstreet, to his dying day, insisted that Sickles' move forward had helped and not hurt the Union cause. And I see, I have a quote, an actual quote from Longstreet on the page. I believe it is now conceded that the advanced position at the Peach Orchard, taken by your corps and under your orders, saved that battlefield to the the Union cause. Okay, I usually pause there because usually someone groans. Okay, but I can't hear I can't hear groans with all these fans going off. But that is Longstreet, 1902, and he basically went to his grave saying, "Yeah." Sickles was the man, okay? And there's a lot of great stories, drinking stories uh, of the two of them. One of my favorite stories is they were in Atlanta in the 1890s celebrating St. Patrick's Day together. So you can imagine these two elderly war heroes getting hammered uh, in Atlanta. And, go, and, and at the end of the night, they're going back to their hotel and Sickles says something to the effect of Longstreet, you know, one of these days you're going to have to apologize for shooting off one of my legs. And Longstreet said, apologize, you ought to thank me for still giving you one good leg to stand on. So these guys had slugged it out on the battlefield, but they became friends uh, supporting each other for the remainder of their lives. Okay, now, is the whole damn battlefield his monument? Well, as again, many of you know the story, Sickles was a problem child till the end of his days. Uh, well into the early 1900s, he held this position with the New York Monuments Commission, and over the course of these years, New York, especially along with Pennsylvania and some of the other larger states, really were uh, prominent in placing a lot of monuments on the battlefield. Now, he was also in trouble in the newspapers uh, right up till about the 50th anniversary of the battle. There was a whole messy uh, public scandal that I don't really have time to go into in great detail, but it involved Sickles getting married for a second time, abandoning his wife uh, in Europe, coming back here, um, and then in, in 1913, the wife tried to come over to the States to try to attempt a reconciliation at the same time that New York State did an audit of the Monument Commission's books, and they found $28,000 unaccounted for that Chairman Sickles did not have a receipt for. So very messy, again, played out in all the public newspapers, and what ultimately happened, there was talk about putting the 90-something war hero, General Sickles, in jail. And they had to, with some last-minute legal maneuvering, they had to, ba he, he basically avoided jail time, but he was embarrassingly deposed as chairman of the, uh, of the Monuments Commission. So what you're looking here is basically his last visit to the battlefield, again, 100 years ago this week, in July of 1913. And again, a common theme when you read those 50th anniversary accounts. Did the veterans hate him like we do? No. Did the men who fought under him hate him like we do? No. He was a celebrity. He was a hero. Probably an eccentric hero to some of them, but a hero nonetheless. And this is a great picture of all the men sort of cheering him as they've um, propped him up center stage here. So it's, it's believed to be at this last uh, reunion of his, this last meeting, it's believed to be, whoops, having a little technical difficulties, there we go, it's believed to be that he reportedly was going out over the battlefield one last time. Sickles is only one, one of only two Union Army Corps commanders who does not have a monument here at Gettysburg, but it was believed that somebody said to him during this last visit, hey Sickles, how do you feel about not having a monument on the field? And he reportedly said, the whole damn battlefield is my monument, so don't worry about it. Um, like a lot of the Sickles story. I think the oral history, although it's often more interesting, is a little suspect when you get into the sources. But if Sickles didn't say it, he should have. That was an appropriate thing for him. So if the whole damn battlefield, though, wasn't his monument, he definitely has his share of it. You know, as I touched on before, he establishes Gettysburg National Military Park in 1895. Uh, he, he was part of what was called the Sickles Map, which created the boundaries that were in effect until 1974. Again, I won't read into all of them, but under his leadership, New York 
York placed 88 monuments on the battlefield, state monument in the National Cemetery, monuments to several New York generals, and a lot of our famous landmarks, Devil's Den, the Wheat Field, and the Peach Orchard, might not even be here today if he had not moved forward. So whether his move was right or wrong for the Union cause, it definitely established the flow of battle that we know today as the second day at Gettysburg. Hell, even the uh, the fence separating the, the local national, the national cemetery from the local Evergreen Cemetery is supposed to be the same one that stood in Lafayette Square in Washington in 1895 when he killed Philip Barton Key. Okay, so I don't ask people to change their minds on Sickles, although I'm sometimes accused of doing that. Uh, I have heard that Sickles is a sociopath, a psychopath, manic, de manic depressive. Look, and if you have your pseudo uh, psychology degree, I'm not going to be able to change your mind in 45 minutes. But he is a hugely important and interesting guy in the Gettysburg story. And if you want to come to Gettysburg and you want to ignore Dan Sickles, I feel sorry for you because you're really missing out on some of the best history and the best stories that Gettysburg has to offer. Okay, and with that, I'm going to conclude. Um, I know we're out of time. Uh, I think we're probably a little short on questions here. It's bloody hot up here. I'm going to be inside signing books, though. If you want to ask me any questions, come on in. And check that. I guess we have time for at least one question. Real quick. Yes, um, I know that they say historicists and, and sickles are the same person, but why do people say that? I mean, I'm just curious as to, you know, it's sort of accepted. But I'm yeah. curious as to why. So the, the question is about Historicus. And what had happened was in the spring of 1864, while Sickles and Meade were sort of bat battling it out before the Congressional Committee on the Conduct of the War, this anonymous newspaper account penned by somebody named Historicus mysteriously showed up in the newspapers, which basically sort of supported General Sickles' position and attacked General Meade. Why do people say Historicus was General Sickles? Because I think, if nothing else, if you sort of compare Historicus to Sickles's prior testimony before the Congressional Committee on the Ta Conduct of the War, it's almost point by point the same argument. And so if Sickles did not go into the historicist mode, and the other thing you want to think about too, as a congressman and an attorney, Sickles was probably much more comfortable fighting battles in newspapers than he was on Civil War battlefields. So I think the historicist account just sounds too much like Sickles to not be Sickles. And we'll never know for certain, but I think, I think historicist was Sickles. Thanks, Billy. Can I do another one? One more? Okay. Now we're going to do one more. That's two. You mentioned that uh, Sickles did not attend West Point, but is it fair to say that he was very courageous on the battlefield? I think so. My critics would disagree with me. I see one of them scowling out there in the audience. I think so. Yeah. I, I, when he, you know what? I'm not even going to qualify that by saying I think so. Yeah, he was, and he proved that. He proved that. Um, he is not, again, love him or hate him, he is not one of the generals that you uh, hear about, you know, shirking behind the lines, you know, sipping from the, the whiskey wagons while the men are going into combat. He's out there. And again, remember, his men loved him. Men love fighting guys who are fighting under guys who are out there with him. Uh, so yeah, you know, I'm not saying he has good judgment, but yeah, he's definitely courageous and he's aggressive too. And sometimes courage, aggression, and lack of training can be a, a lethal concoction. But yeah, absolutely a brave guy. I'll stand by that. We have one more, or is that it? Okay, that's it. Oh, oh hand kind of going up. All right, we're done. I'll see you inside. Take care.